can hear it in the crackle of a bonfire I can hear it in the middle of the ocean water Oh, I just can't explain But it makes me want to cry And I can hear it when the rain falls on my windowsill On the playground where children's laughter lives Oh, I can't explain But it makes me want to cry And I can hear it in the busy New York City streets And I can hear it in the country Georgia fields of green Oh, I just can't explain No, but it makes me want to cry Sounds like grandmama Telling you where you come from Said it's kind of like laughter Out of the mouths of your loved ones or Catching up with an old friend Reminiscing on back when It's like a summertime sprinkler Street side with my ice cream cone Said it sounds like a choir Singing hymns, hallelujah It's the voice of God Make a grown man cry and I can hear it on the wind of an early morning When the fog is getting thick and the birds are chirping Oh, it's just something I can't explain No, but it makes me want to cry And I can hear it in the hush of a midnight hour I'm alone in my room if I'm going under Oh, it's just something I can't explain No, but it brings me back to life It's like the sound of a newborn baby crying Yeah, like the final breath of a loved one passing Oh, it's a beautiful thing Yeah, cause it leads me to the light like a drive through movie Small town with the big screen Like grilling out in the front yard Sometimes it's the simple things Like storytelling with my grandpa He was so easy to believe Right when the sun goes up, yeah Sometimes it's better when the sun comes down Cause this is something about the moonlight And it can make you feel alright, oh Make a grown man cry. Good morning and welcome to Be the Ram Global Fellowship. I'm your pastor, Pastor Coach Anthony McKissick Sr., and I'm elated that you chose to fellowship with us this morning. There's plenty of places that you could have gone, but you chose to be with us. And because you made that decision, because God ordained this appointment, I know that we're all blessed. I know that we appreciate you. And I know that there's a word from God that you came to hear. And it is our duty as the church to make sure you get what you came for. Once again, I'm Pastor Coach Anthony McKissick Sr., and I am excited, and I am blessed, and I am pleased that you chose to fellowship with us. If this is your first time fellowshipping with us, I want you to comment down below. Say, hey, Pastor Coach, this is my first time. You may not know what to expect. We're a virtual church. <laughs> you do know that much. However, we do things a little bit different. We're pretty much a church without walls and we're focused on winning the 97 percent what does that mean i'm glad you asked you might not have asked but i'm act like you did so if you do the math there's so many hours that you would usually spend 
in a church building. I know what you're saying. Nobody's in a church building right now. Correct. The church should reside in your heart and in your spirit. But we did the math right. Let's say if you went to church on Sunday for three hours, two hours if you're Methodist, one hour if you're Catholic. And then you went to Bible study, whether it be on Wednesday or Thursday or Tuesday for two hours. That time combined is the 3% of hours throughout your week. What we're focused on is not what you do during that 3%. We're focused on the 97% of the time that you're not at church. We think, we know, and we believe that is what is important. Because we can all put on our church clothes, and we don't have them here at Be The Ram, by the way. We can put our church clothes on, and what that means is we can put on a front while we're in the building. We can put on a front on Sundays. We can come in uh, holier than thou on Wednesdays. We can shit about a Honda, shaka 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 zoo. We can speak it all in every tongue. But if we're not showing compassion and love, then what are we doing during that other 97%? So we challenge you to be a Christian outside of the church building. We challenge you to be the light in a negative situation. Just because the doors of the church open does not mean that the church closed. It never closed. Newsflash, it's always been open because it has always been within you. You are a lot of people's only view of a church. So what you do matters. Make sure you win the 97%. And now what we have is something we call putting somebody in the game. What does that mean? That comes from my coaching background. As a coach, when you look down that sideline, everybody wants to get in. And this is an opportunity for you to put somebody in the game. That means you invite them to church. You invite them to this service. How do you do it? Send them a link. DM them. Text them. Post it as your status on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or whatever you're going to do. But make sure you let somebody know that you care about that Be The Ram Global Fellowship is live and it's going to be good, and you are inviting them. You're sharing a personal part of your life with them. Now, prayerfully, they'll join in with us and pray and have a good time and fellowship and worship and do all of the above. But if they don't, you at least did your part. Your job is to get them here. My job is to water them, and God's job is to grow them. And we all work together on one accord. So right now, I challenge you, on this Valentine's Day Sunday, the day of love, to show love to three people and put them in the game. We'll be back and we'll give you time to do that. And we'll put up some uh, announcements on the screen while you go and share this message. God bless you. How many people did you put in the game? I hope you put at least three. Some of you all went above and beyond. I know one of our members, Jacob Owens, down there in Texas, he probably sent this thing to about 20 or 30 people. And if you're part of that Texas family as a, a result of Owens, God bless you. I know he's been hitting you up, talking about you got to get on the boat, you got to do this, you got to do that. He is excited about Christ. We love you. We appreciate you. We are glad that you are on the boat, you and your entire family. Hey, mom. Hey, sister. Hey, kids. We're glad that you are here. Now, today is not just any other Sunday. It is Valentine's Day. And my son, who's 11 years old, he said, hey, dad, yesterday, he said, 
is Valentine's Day about girls or is it about boys? I said, it's a day of love. And it's generally focused on the woman, focused on the girl. But by the way you're showing love, it also affects you. See, God said in the Bible that love conquers all. So a day like this, Valentine's Day, is a day that can conquer all. If we show love and compassion towards our brothers and sisters, our mothers, our fathers, our wives, our spouses, our girlfriends, then this should be a winning day. See how we work that thing out? Not only is it Valentine's Day, but it is also my sister Dominique Gray's birthday. Happy birthday. I'm not going to put your age out there, but I am glad that you made it over the hump. You are now in this club that we're in. Yeah, I know I'm a little bit older than you, but you're in now. You're here. So happy birthday. We pray that you have a great day. We pray that you are blessed. And tomorrow is another birthday. It's a special birthday. My aunt shared a birthday with my dad. And it is February 16th, the day after love. Ain't that some? The day of love is today. And the day after love is tomorrow. My father passed away in October. So this is our first time as a family that we will have a birthday of my dad's and he's not here. I know he's here in spirit, but we don't physically get to touch him. We don't physically get to hug him. We don't get to tell him happy birthday face to face. So it's almost like we have to asynchronously tell him that we love you. We appreciate what you did while you were here. And you are not forgotten. Daddy, I love you. I appreciate what you've done. You were a pivotal moment of this ministry. I had a conversation with my wife and you know we were in the middle of the pandemic and we always knew that we were going to launch our church and she said well, what are you in such a rush for? You know we just need to stay in faith walk until this thing clears up. Now of course like everybody else no one knew how long the pandemic would last. And if we had done that, we would still be in our mother church because the pandemic has not gone anyway, anywhere. It's actually gotten worse. So I began to plan and we began to plan, and I said, you know what? We're going to get this thing off the ground. We're going to go. I know what God has called us to do. I know what he's telling me. And she, you know, she, she, she goes on with what I said. She's a very supportive wife. She is the definition of a help meet. She's that Proverbs 31. She, we have been celebrating Valentine's Day all month. I'll let y'all fill in the blanks. However, I said, oh, you know, we're going to open up in June. Now, there's no building. There's no walls. There's, there was no congregation. We didn't have a music ministry. We didn't have anything. We didn't have a constitution. And she kind of felt like it was being rushed. And I finally told her, well, wife, baby, I'm opening this church on Father's Day as a gift to my father because we don't know how long he'll be here with us. So I want him to see his son as a pastor before he crosses over. Now, he wasn't sick. He did have an ailment in his body, but he was a happy man. And then at that point, she said, okay, 
when I finally explained to her that we had celebrated 58 and we had a big party and 59 we didn't celebrate as much but on 60 he came up and we all went to Golden Corral and we blew out candles and we talked about a family reunion. I said that I want to make sure that he gets this gift. And she was all on board. My brother Donnie down there in Opelika, I said, Donnie, you got to make sure that daddy watches this first service. I'm pretty sure he did not watch it. <laughs> but I know that my brother did his job to make sure that he at least had the opportunity to watch it. Knowing him, he probably went back to sleep, you know, and watched it a little later. But then I did find out from Donnie that he would be in there listening. So that would make me feel well. However, you know, he did end up passing away, as I said, in October. And had I not listened to God, he would have never gotten a chance to see this. Now, he didn't get to see on earth what it's going to become, but he did get to see the beginning of it. And the word of God says that a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. So he was able to see that no matter what he did in his life, that he was a good man, because this here is an inheritance for my kids, which is his kids' kids. So once again, Daddy, I want to say happy birthday. I love you. The whole family loves you. We miss you. And I know that you're smiling down from heaven right now. And you're enjoying what you're seeing. God bless you. Hello, guys. This is Pastor Coach McKissick with your BTR, Total Body Affirmation. I want you to repeat this every day when you wake up. This declaration is about speaking greatness and blessings over your life. You know, as well as I know, that when you wake up, the devil is busy. He's already whispering in your ear, but we're going to whisper back today. Look, repeat it after me. God, you are the head of my life. With all my heart, I will fight the good fight. With my feet, I will walk by faith and not by sight. With my mouth, I will speak life and not death. God, I promise to give you what's right and not what's left. God, you will provide the wisdom, the resources, and the discernment to allow me to be the ram when my opportunity comes. Amen, amen, and amen. You guys have a blessed day. Thank God that he has given you another opportunity. If you just did that, I promise you, you just start your day off the right way. God bless you. And now I'm going to give you an opportunity to bless this ministry with your tithes and your offering. This is the time set out that you worship God with your giving. The word of God says that if you give, the, the windows of heaven will be open and they will pour a blessing out on you that you don't have room enough to receive. Now what does that mean when it means that you don't have room enough to receive? What that means is that all those who are connected to you, those who are close to you, as a result of your obedience and your discipline and your ministry to God in giving, your blessings will overflow and fall on them. Just imagine yourself as a cup, and you have that cup on a saucer, and God is pouring into you, and blessings are coming down, and eventually it runneth over. And everything on the saucer then gets wet. And if there's no saucer, it's a table. And the blessings just roll and they roll. That's what happens. And I'm not telling you a fairy tale. I'm telling you what I know and what I have lived. There was times that 
I didn't have a dime in my bank account. But when I did get my check, I tithed my 10% off of my gross, not my net, the first fruit, which is my gross. I will not rob God. I'm not going to pay my taxes and not pay my tithes. And I paid my tithes and I gave my offering. And, and the budget said red, but at the end of the day, it was green and it was blue. I never missed a meal. I never went without. I was never evicted from any residence. My house has never gone into foreclosure. Even when I was homeless, I still paid my tithes and my offering. And you may say, well, well, you wouldn't have been homeless if you wouldn't have been giving the church all your money. I'll let you think what you want to think. However, look at me now. God is still blessing me. God will take you through something just to see if you'll forsake him in your time of hurt and your time of despair. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to bless God and your tithes and your offering. It goes in the good ground. We are based on winning the 97 percent. We outreach and we reach out. We bless homeless people. We, we feed the needy, the hungry. We are a church that goes above and beyond. We may be distant, but we are not disconnected. We're not disconnected from, from what, is, what the needs are in the community. We're not disconnected from you. We're still connected. If you want to give, go to our website, www.betheram.com backslash giving. Or you can do it via cash app, dollar sign BTR Global. Go ahead now and give your tithes and offering, and I will do the same. I'm not going to do anything. I ask you to do anything that I'm not going to do myself. God bless you. And after that, we will have our praise and worship, and then a great short, quick word from me. Let's go. Was 
I'm so glad that you're still with us. Let us pray. God, thank you for this moment. Thank you for this opportunity. Please uh, come into my spirit. Let me decrease and you increase. All of the things that, that, that may be troubling me right now and that may be troubling your people, please give us a moment of clarity. Please remove the distractions that may hinder your word from coming across. If it's me that is a distraction, let them just, maybe they just turn the screen off and, and listen to the word and hear your voice through your humble servant. God, you are miraculous. You are amazing. You are the healer. You are the king of kings. You're Jehovah Jireh. You're Jehovah Rapha. You're Jehovah Nisi. God, you're Jehovah Makedesh. You're Jehovah Shalom. You're everything to us. You've given us a new day. You've given us breath. 
you've given us everything that we have and you have also taken things out of our sight. You've protected us when we didn't even know we were being protected. God, you're holy. God, you're mighty. And we just come to you in this moment. We invite you in. We invite your spirit into this atmosphere. We, we, we tell you and we, we summon you to infest this area. Take over. Be one with us. Reign on us. Enter us. Embody us. God, don't let this word fall on deaf ears. Give your people what they came for. There's somebody under the sound of my voice. They're holding on by a string. And God, I, God, give it to them. Give me the words to say, to speak to their spirit. God, whatever you tell me to say, I'll say it. You have my full attention. Amen, amen, and amen. So it is uh, Black History Month. Now, I'm going to start off with a little story, right? So, we're having professional development. I'm a high school teacher. I'm not going to say any names because this is not meant to embarrass anyone. But it really just kind of goes to, goes along with my message here. So, we have professional development as teachers. And I signed up for a course. It was called Slang. Now, I'm a PE teacher, so we've got to pick three to go to. Most of us just don't want to be, it's, it's Friday, kids ain't there, we don't really want to be there. So I'm not going to pick something that I think is boring. We could have done curriculum, we could have done leadership. I want to know what this slang thing about. I talk, I think I talk slang a lot. So I, I, I signed up for the class and, you know, like most teachers, I logged in like the kids do us. And I'm talking to my assistant coach. We're talking about next year's season. We're talking about this kid, that kid, who's going to be good, who's going to be bad. And then I start hearing the, the, the seminar going on, and I'm like, well, well am, am I being punked? Is Ashton Kutcher going to jump out and say, ha-ha, gotcha? Or is this just some, like, trick on me because I wasn't paying attention? And it was a, uh, a Caucasian female, young lady, probably about – 26, no older than 28. And she led the session and she began to talk about Ebonics. So then I'm like honed in. And I didn't realize that my camera was on at the time. I didn't have one of those situations like the lawyer said, I I'm not a cat. And like, that was funny. I didn't have that situation. However, uh, you know, so I I'm kind of making some facial expressions when she's going through these Ebonics. And the first thing I thought to myself, it is Black History Month, and there is a Caucasian lady teaching me and a bunch of other African Americans about slang and Ebonics. We're already two times wrong here. And then she began to say words all out of Kotex. That was a joke. I know what I'm talking about here. So words like bruh. And I'm thinking in the back of my head, ma'am, you can't say bruh. You know, that's just, it just does not, it doesn't go well. It's not going to work how you think it's going to work. Please don't say bruh. But, you know, it is what it is. I can't interrupt because I am a professional. And then she said, uh, it's the blank for me. So she's teaching pretty much the other teachers how to relate to the youth. And it was all fine and dandy. Until she said, pull up and, uh, and bet. Now, she said that pull up was a friendly word. And at that point, the chat is just going crazy here. And I, this is not a made up story, but the chat is going crazy. And I had to speak up at that point because pull up is not friendly. Yeah, all, it is an African-American colloquialism that it's used to pretty much insinuate that hands will be thrown, fists will be swung, there will be violence. So the last thing I want to do is tell an angry parent or student that if you have an issue, pull up. 
because if I do that, I am inviting danger to myself. So my antennas raised and she said, bet, pull up. So what that really means, if you ever hear someone in the African-American culture say, bet, you really have a good five minutes to decide if you're going to fight or if you're going to have a flight. Because bet means I'm leaving, and when I return, there's going to be action. So bet has nothing to do with Vegas when used in, in, in that sense. And pull up does not mean we're about to have a conversation. So I spoke up, and other teachers spoke up. However, there were some in the chat that did not understand what was going on, and they started calling the other teachers who were speaking up unprofessional. And I wanted to let them know that this is the professional way of saying that you're messing up right now. Needless to say, the uh, seminar ended, the video disappeared, but of course, we live in the screenshot generation, so there's notes all about it, and, and they're talking, and the chat was deleted. Now that leads me to the title of my message. You've been canceled. You've been canceled. And I'm pretty sure, without a shadow of a doubt, that teacher has been canceled. Now what does it mean to be canceled? I'm not saying that she's going to lose her job, and I don't think she should. I think there was a misunderstanding, and that was a very teachable moment. But what we mean in the African-American community that you've been counseled is that your influence has been taken away. There is no more effect. You don't have that that, that, that strong influence that you used to have. So you have been counseled and it usually comes behind making a poor decision or selling out your community. So you've been counseled means that your influence has been ended. And the title of my message is that you've been counseled. And what we mean by counsel here today is that your condition has been counseled. See, a lot of us are dealing with things in our body. And it, today I'm here to tell you that it has been counseled. I need you to speak over your life and say, you have been counseled. Whatever the issue is, you've been counseled. If it's a, uh, a, an ailment, you've been counseled. If it's depression, you've been counseled. But today is the day that you speak up and you speak back and you let that thing know that you've been counseled. My message text comes from the book of Luke, chapter 17, excuse me, chapter 7, verses 11 through 17. That is the pericope of it all, but I will focus on verse 13 right now. And I'll put it on the screen and also read it to you. Once again, that is Luke chapter 7, verses 13. And it reads, And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion and said to her, Weep not. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion and said to her, Weep not. That is the word of God for the people of God. Would the people of God please say amen? Now, what does that mean that he had compassion? So the word compassion means a sympathetic pity and concern for the sufferings or misfortunes of others. So the Lord saw her and he was sympathetic for her. He had sympathy. And he cared about what she cared about. Who is she? Now I have to go back to the full story so that you can understand who this woman is. 
if we go back to verse 7, and we'll read on to verse 17, the story starts off when Jesus is going into a town and there's a sick centurion. And the leader comes and they all want Jesus to heal the man. But the leader says to him, I'm a leader just like you. And, and I don't feel as though you should come into my house because I'm not worthy. But you are a leader and you have enough authority that if you just pass by and, and say it, if you speak on it, then it will happen. And Jesus said that never have I seen such faith as the man, the centurion. And he sent him on his way. He said that he's healed. And by the time he got back to where the sick man was, he was up talking, happy-go-lucky, and healed. And that's where our text picks up here. Verse 11 says, Soon afterward, soon after this healing, Jesus went to a town called Nain. And his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. So he's coming in after doing one healing, and he has a crowd following with him. So this is a lot of people. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was also a widow. So let's paint the picture. You have one crowd walking in happy. And as they get to the gate, as they get to the point that you enter a territory, that you enter a place, they hear moaning, they hear wailing, they hear crying. Because it said that a large crowd was with the woman too. So as Jesus came in, he was with a happy crew. He had just healed a man. So he had a, a great following. But at the same time, the parallel, the irony here is that as Jesus, the healer, is coming in, there's a woman who just lost her son. And this woman isn't new to loss because she also was a widow. So she had lost one man, her husband, and now she lost her only son. So her only hope to further her generation, to further her people, was being carried by pallbearers. So isn't it something how at the same place, at the same time, there could be a happy group and there could be a moaning group? See, as we were in that professional development, there were a group of moaners. There were some upset sisters and brothers in that group. I wasn't as upset. I actually thought it was funny. But at the same time, there was a group saying, you're doing such an amazing job. Because this group was so out of tune in touch with this group that they did not understand that somebody was in pain. But ain't you glad that Jesus can see past what everybody else sees? Because when the story says that when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her and he said, don't cry. So the Lord was walking in his crowd and he was happy and everybody was happy. But ain't you glad you serve a God that won't get caught up in the crowd? that he will see you in your situation, even though he's surrounded by people who are blessed. He's surrounded by people who are telling him how good he is and how great he is, and you just did this, you just raised the man from the dead, you just healed the centurion, man, but he still cared enough about you and what you are going through right now. See, I know a mother personally who just lost her son. And every time she speaks on it, 
I'm lost for words because I don't have anything that I can tell her that will make her feel any better. I do have compassion for her, and I pray for her, but I don't have what she needs. But the word of God said, when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry. Then he went up and touched the bear or the casket, and they were carrying him, that they were carrying him, and the bearer stood still. And the reason they did this is because you don't just touch a casket, especially in that time. Imagine that you are at a funeral and the, 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 you know, the processional is going and the pallbearers are carrying your loved ones and a random guy comes up and touches the casket. There's probably going to be a bad situation there. That's just something that you don't do. So the pallbearers stood still. And I guess at this point, they're trying to figure out how do we respond here? Do I be the light or do I start to fight? And then he said, he is Jesus, young man, I say to you, get up. And then the dead man sat up and began to talk. It's getting good. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praise God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. The news about, the, about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. So here's a couple things that I need you to home in about this whole story because I need you to understand that your condition has been canceled. Your condition has been canceled. See, as I said before, Jesus walked in happy and he came with a happy crowd, but he was not so happy he was not so in his feelings and his emotions that he did not have enough compassion to notice her passion. See, when passion, which is a strong feeling, the definition of passion is a strong and barely co controllable emotion. When passion collides with compassion, things change. When you care so much about something that it draws compassion from the Lord, then he will recognize your situation. See, when you care about something to the point that your cry, your moan, your wail moves Jesus, then that's the situation. I'm going to give you five points that will let you know your condition is canceled. As I said, point number one, your condition is canceled when Jesus is moved by your passion. When Jesus is moved by your passion, now I want you to theoretically speaking and thinking that as the woman, this was pretty much as she walked in this line she watched her last bit of hope. She lost her husband, and I'm sure when she lost her husband, she said, at least I have our son. At least I still have my baby boy. No matter how old he was, it was still her baby boy. But when her son passed away, this may have been it. This was the straw that broke the camel's back. So she really was passionate about this thing. See, I need you to understand that when you care about something so much, you can't listen to what other people say. 
No, no, it may not be a, a physical death. It may not be your son or your child. It may just be your dream. It may be your vision. It may be your ministry. It may be your marriage or it may be your partnership. But when you have invested your entire life into a situation and it dies and it becomes non-responsive, when it does not answer your call, you don't always just throw it away. See, they were carrying something that was dead. And you may say, why didn't they just bury it? Why are we crying about something that is gone? Because it was more than that to this woman. It was something very serious. It was her child. So when you have a situation that you are passionate about, you don't easily let it go. You may carry it for a long time dead because you're giving CPR to that dead situation. And I know there's a meme that says stop giving CPR to dead situations, but they don't know how important that dead situation is to you. They don't understand that you invested all that you had and you put all of your last into this situation. So it's not so easy to let it go. It's not so easy to just leave him or her alone and get a divorce and move on with your life because you are watching something that you care about being, being carried to a place that is going to be put down. So if you imagine that, you can halfway understand the passion that the woman had when she wailed and when she moaned. So your condition is canceled when your passion moved Christ. So when you care so much that when the Lord comes around, when he comes in your neighborhood, when he's in your street, something is drawn to him. And it said, hold up. I need to check on my servant, John. I need to see what Ashley has going on. Emily, Jill, Joanne, Joseph, why are you crying? What is bothering you? Stop crying. I got you. And then what did Jesus do? Point number two, your condition is counseled when Jesus touches it. When Jesus puts his hand on your condition, it's going to change. See, he came up and he went against the culture. He wasn't worried about who was going to say what. He wasn't worried about the pallbearers jumping on him. He wasn't worried about going viral, helping somebody out. His condition changed because Jesus touched him. See, when Jesus puts his hand on your life, things change. When Jesus puts his hand on your finances, things change. That's why I'm so adamant about paying my tithes and my offering. I may slip in every other area, but I'm going to pay my tithes because I've seen him do it. I've seen him bless me. I've seen him feed me. I've seen him speak to other people and they just sent me money and said, I was thinking about you. You were on my mind. So don't worry so much about how he's going to do it. But when he comes and he interrupts the crowd and he interrupted them because the pallbearers stood still. And we're talking about a, a, lie, a grown man here. So this ain't no, you know, this is not a little child. This is a heavy burden that they're carrying. This is a, a heavy situation that you're carrying. But when Jesus came in the room, when he walked up to the casket, I don't know what y'all talking about, but when he reached out and he put his hand on it, it made everybody stop. So you need to understand when God has his hand on you, when God has his hand on your situation, when God has his hand on your mind, then your condition is about to change. 
And how do you know that God has his hand on you? I had a conversation with my wife last night, and he was just, God was speaking to her, and he was dropping things in her. And, and I, could just, I, I saw the glory of the Lord just shining all over her. And I knew that he had his hands on her, and he was just making deposits, and he was making deposits, and he was, he was giving her visions, and he was giving her, her ministries and blessings, and, and I can't wait to see how it all plays out. But you know without a shadow of a doubt that God has his hands on you because things just start to happen miraculously. It just starts to happen. So when... Jesus is moved by your passion, your condition is counseled. When he touches your condition, it's counseled. And point number three, your condition is counseled when he speaks to it. See, the voice of God can call things that are dead to life. And what Jesus did was he spoke to the man. Here in the scripture, he said, young man, I say to you, get up. He said, get up. How crazy did he sound speaking to a dead situation and saying, get up. See, once again, You can't be so concerned about how you look when you do these things. You can't be concerned about who knows you went back to that husband that cheated on you. You can't be so concerned when how how you look when you start speaking life and not death. When you start saying, I am a millionaire. When you start saying, I am a winner. I'm not a whiner. I'm the head and I'm not the tail. But everybody that's looking at you, they see you homeless. They see you out there struggling, and they're saying, this joker has lost his ever-gotten mind. What are you talking about that you are rich? What are you talking about that you are a fool? But you are speaking what God has told you to speak. And you will look crazy to those in the other crowd, in the crowd that's focused on wailing and moaning and crying. But there is a welcoming committee over here that has already seen Jesus heal. They have already seen Jesus raise folks from the dead. So it's not a surprise to them. See, you have to change who you are associating yourself with because where you're headed, it's not going to line up with the people that you're with now because the people that you are with now They won't understand you when you start speaking at a higher level, when you start calling things that are dead to life, when you go into your classroom and say, I am in the best school in the state. I am in one of the top schools in the nation. These kids will be great. My staff will be great. When you get on the treadmill and say, today I'm going to work harder than I've ever worked in my life, and tomorrow I'm going to do the same thing. These knees will line up. The cancer will shrink. My blood pressure will balance out. I will no longer have to stick my my finger because of a, a diabetes. When you start saying that, you're going to sound crazy to all the folks sitting in the urgent care. But to all of those folks on this other side who've already been healed from Christ, to all of the the millionaires who used to be homeless, to the Tyler Perrys, to the Oprah Renfries, you're going to sound like, I am so glad that you finally found out who you are. I promise you, when Jesus speaks to a situation, it's going to change. And he's speaking to your situation right now in your life. If that is you and you know God is speaking to you, just lift your hands and say, God, I receive it. God, I thank you for what you are doing. I thank you for speaking over my situation. God, I can't do it without you. And I hear you loud and clear. Things are changing. Point number four, your condition is counseled. 
when Jesus requires an immediate response. See, when he requires a response, that means it's time to do something different. See, he didn't just only speak to the boy. But he said what? He said, young man, I say to you, get up. <clears throat> he said, he gave him a command. And the command was to get up. So it's not enough to hear from God. I know you hear me. Oh, this is good. It's not enough to hear God's word, but you have to be doers of God's word. And I'm just, Liana, Bay, wife. He's already in deposited in your life. But your condition is going to be counseled because he is asking you right now to get up. It requires, get up requires an immediate response. Now, if he told you when you feel better, get up. If he said when you're ready to preach, start preaching. No. Then you would have had time to decide how long do I want to wallow in the mud? How long do I want to woe it's me? But no, he said, get up, young man. So that meant that expeditiously something had to happen because when Jesus speaks, he requires an action. And the young man got up. See, if I had of waited for the crowd to agree it was time to open Be The Ram Global Fellowship, then my dad would have never seen it because they still don't agree that it's time to open, but we're here. We're open. The doors of the church are open. It's virtual. But when God spoke to me, it required an immediate response. I didn't know that four or five months later, I'd be speaking at his graveside, but Jesus already knew what was going to happen. So he told me something that required an immediate response. And that's where a lot of us are stuck. Our condition has been canceled, but we don't know it because we have not responded to the call. So we are sitting pretty much in our old condition, even though it's been counseled. See, you are, you're, you're not even bonded. You're not even held by what used to hold you, but you don't know it because you refuse to get up. It, it, it's almost like you're sitting in a jail cell. And you're, you're, you're in your bed, you're, you're just throwing stuff up at the top bunk. And the door is wide open to the jail. But you won't leave out of that door because you won't get up. So you are imprisoned in your mind. You are imprisoned in your body. You are imprisoned in your culture. You are imprisoned in your situation because you refuse to respond to what God is telling you to do. There's too many of us walking around unresponsive. For all of the teachers right now in this virtual atmosphere, the one thing that we can all agree on, we can't stand a non-responsive student. We're sitting here teaching our heart out, giving them our best lesson plan, and the only thing you see is an icon and no response. So it's almost like you are talking to a computer that does not respond. And, and you don't like it. There's no way around it. You don't like it. You almost want to log off on the kid and tell him you had internet problems. So how do you feel or how do you think God feels when he's giving you his best, which is his son, and you're still non-responsive? I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to your neighbor down the street. How do you think they feel? How do you think God feels 
when you refuse to respond to his command. Turn your mic on, son. Turn your camera on, son. I need you to hear. I need you to see. I need to see who I'm talking to. I need to see my creation walking in greatness. I need to see my creation walking alive. I need to see my creation healthy. I need you to tell me. I need you to enunciate with your voice that, God, you are God. You are Jehovah Jireh. You are the head of my life. You are doing things that, that I never thought I can do. It's time for you to respond to Christ. And last but not least, your condition is counseled when Jesus returns it to you. See, it said that the dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. See, your situation that you think is dead after Jesus touches it, speaks to it, and gets a response from it, he's going to give it back to you. But it's not going to be dead. So the thing that everyone watched you fail at, the thing that everyone watched you lose, and they saw you crying, they saw you weeping, Jesus is going to touch it, talk to it, fix it, get a response from it, and then he's going to give it back to you. And, and what happens when he does that? It says that the news about Jesus spread throughout Judea. They were all filled with awe and praise God. A great prophet has appeared among us. So it really was never about you. The, the revival of the dead situation in your life was so that God can get some praise so that others can be blessed by watching you go down watching your marriage die watching you lose the house watching you lose the car lose the kids and then get it all back better than it was before because this time, when you get it back, you're not worried about losing it because you've lost it before and God had your back. So now when you go into that business, you have a different mindset because you have a, an almost a, a mindset that I can't be defeated because I know that Christ is walking with me. See, when I went through situations in my life, I lost the house before. I, I, I've lost a vehicle before. I've not drove, but I got it all back. I got it all back. And I thank God for it. So, you really got to understand that the thing that has been bothering you most, that condition that pretty much has been dead in your life, but you are so passionate about it that you carried it around anyway. It was heavy. It was a burden. It weighed you down. It may be your relationship with your teenage child. It may be a relationship with a parent. It weighed you down so bad, but it was so important to you that you couldn't let it go. That condition has been canceled. And starting today, you're going to see a difference in it. You're going to see a difference in the way that you talk to each other. You're going to see a difference in the way that your husband looks at you. You're going to see a difference in the way that your wife respects you. The way that your kids answer your call. When your voice is projected into the atmosphere, into the environment, you're going to see a difference at the response. Now, I want to pray with you. If you bow your heads and close your eyes and lift your hands into a position of surrender, God, thank you for counseling our conditions. God, we carried these dead things around for so long. 
and, and we looked crazy because we were always thinking that today is going to be the day that I can take this thing off of life support and it's going to start breathing again on its own. And God, we are touching and agreeing and we're calling out and reaching out to you that today will be the day that our future is jump-started. Today will be the day that you speak life into our dead situations, that you give us a moment of clarity, that you give us an understanding. And God, we're going to respond. When you call us, we're going to respond. We're going to answer the call this time. We're not going to drop the ball, and we're going to do right by it when we get it. God, we're always going to give you honor. We're always going to give you praise. God, there's someone under the sound of my voice right now that says, my situation ain't dead. I'm dead. I'm walking wounded. I'm like a zombie. I don't know whether I'm going or if I'm coming. To that person, God, you embody them right now. You touch them. You touch their spirit. Speak to them. Blow a breath of fresh air and life into their life into their body. Let them love themselves like they've never loved themselves before. Let them be encouraged. Let them be strengthened. To that child who was distant from their mother, who said, I don't, I, I, I don't mess with them like that no more. I, I'm tired of it. Tell them, tell them to look at it one more time. It's, it's canceled. It's canceled. It's canceled. Say it, say it to you. It's canceled. It's canceled. It's canceled. That cancer is canceled. Those diabetes is canceled. The sickle cell is canceled. The depression is canceled. Mm. The extreme obesity is canceled. You can look like you used to look. Don't let the devil tell you that it's too late. As long as you got breath in your body, it's never too late. Mm. God, we love you. God, we ask you to come into our body. We ask you that you come into you come into our spirit. God, we ask that you clean out all those things that aren't like you so that we can give you glory and that we can stand upright and be a great representation of you. God, I ask that you go into the, into the school buildings, you go into the hospitals, you go in, in, into the courtrooms. God, be the change. Let us be the ram. God, 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 let us know this week who we need to love on, and we'll do it. We'll, we'll respond. Speak to our people. God, we love you. We honor you, and we praise you. In your mighty name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. I know this word was for somebody, and if it was for you, let us know so that we can touch and agree virtually that it's going to be done. We love you on behalf of my wife and my children and our whole church family, which is growing expeditiously. We thank you for spending this time with us. Once again, happy Valentine's Day, happy birthday, happy heavenly birthday. We love you. We honor you because you are a child of God. Don't let anybody this week tell you that you are less than great because you are great. You are called by greatness to be great. This is Pastor Coach McKissick of Be The Ram Global Fellowship, and I am challenging you to win the 97% this week and be the ram in somebody's life. God loves you, and so do I, and I'm out.